thank you for coming. Um, I gave a similar talk a few days ago in Germany, and um, this is just a, a different angle to this stuff. Um, so uh, slides are at this URL. I also updated the slides on the, uh, uh, the session uh, description. Um, so this is the linked research general initiative that I will this will touch on. There's one article you might want to look at. It's a, it's a peer-reviewed article on my website. Slides are CC BY. The application that one of the applications that I will demo is uh, called Dokily. It's over here. Um, this is me. That's my web ID that represents me and all that you need to know about me. Not not from me, but from there. Uh, I am not sure what's going on. <laughs> okay, so um, I am affiliated with Hanover. I'm doing my PhD with University of Bonn. I am based in Switzerland. I am Canadian. <laughs> and uh, so part of this work also has to do with, uh, so we'll go over social web work group, W3C social web work groups uh, output, um, the work that I've done with Dokali when I was at MIT in CSAIL um, with the SOLID project. Um, maybe you've heard of it, we can talk about that as well at one of the slides. Um, so yeah, it's just a sort of an ongoing work. Um, feedback is welcome. And what I hope you take away from this is maybe just re, re, qu you know, coming back to the assumptions that we have, uh, really questioning what's required of us from you know, having, conducting scholarly communication, especially that's on the web. Um, yeah. So let's get to it. And uh, so this is going to be a very web-centric talk. Um, web is essentially a social machine. So we, what we do to it and what happens on the web, it feeds back to the society and, and then just you know, the cycle continues. And when Tim Berners-Lee came up with or proposed the web, he wanted to see uh, as a social, have a social effect. So it wasn't like a technical uh, problem solved necessarily, but um, Something to see, something to help the society. Um, I don't want to offend anyone, and uh, I just want to cover some basic grounds that we're all on the same page. Um, so, architecture of the web, there's three layers to it um, they, I, a way to identify things, a way to uh, interact with things, and the sort of the, the data or the content that you know, we, we get a hold of it. Um, and each of the spe you know, specifications that uh, we have, like web standards that we have, uh, either of these layers, they don't affect the other one. So if you come up with a new URI scheme, um, it doesn't, you don't need to change all your formats, or you shouldn't have to. All the specs are built with that sort of um, idea in mind. Um, and uh, so you know, data formats could be from HTML to an RDF serialization, um, and interaction can be HTTP or FTP, and so on. Um, so yeah, these are links. You can go up there and uh, follow through if, if you need to read these documents later on. Um, so anyone can say anything they like on the web, technically speaking, and that's good news. And the bad news is that anyone can say anything they want <laughs> on the web, especially it's a bit scary for scholarly communication or scholarly publishing. So we need to figure out how to maybe get around that. So the web enables, you know, gives us this out of the box. We need to work with that. Um, so. Uh, let's maybe work with uh, some of the basic assumptions that we have with the web, um, and maybe we can, you know, still keep them around or, or you know, use them to our advantage. And one of the things is is uh, the ability to express ourselves, and we don't have to really ask anyone to express ourselves. Uh, again, technically speaking, you can publish a blog post, you can say pretty much what you want, right? Um, and along with that is, of course, you can, uh, you know style it, you can you know, add interactivity, uh, shape the document, the content in a way that's meaningful or that's a way uh, that's most use useful to the reader, right? So if you think that adding interactivity to your scholarly uh, articles, perhaps that's the best, best way to you know, talk about your algorithm in there. Uh, if, you want, if you think that's a static uh, you know, a version of an article is the best way to communicate, that's also your decision. So, the web enables us to have this freedom to, you know, shape that content, uh, you know, in a way that's suitable. Um, decentralization. So um, we'll get into that in more detail later. But obviously, web is inherently decentralized. 
uh, we do acknowledge that there's, of course, centralization um, happening, and whoever has more power, then uh, that kind of makes the system a bit more difficult to work with. I mean, we have um, you know giant social networks, which are sort of what everybody's hopping on, and that has consequences, right? So, but we want to see whether the inherent um, characteristics of the web can be used in a way where we build systems with. Interoperability, um, that has to do with, of course, mainly using open web standards uh, or standards based on open consensus. Um, and we want, we care about the, our, our content to be reusable um, across different applications. So if you put something on the web, uh, then any, for example, HTML allows us, uh, you know, we, we put something on the web in HTML, you can use any web browser that understands HTML uh, and you know, do something with it, display it for you. So it doesn't matter if you use a graphical user interface or a command line interface, it's still HTML and knows what to do with it. Uh, same with HTTP and URI, right? If your program knows what to do with HTTP and URI, then okay, you're good. So we're aiming, we want to aim for those things. We don't, we don't care about, like, uh, what we don't really care about is specific applications, uh, you know, uh, doing things and you know, hoping that everybody should use those applications. Universal access, this is holistic. We want um, uh, accessibility um, of content and applications. Um, we want uh, usability, of course, uh, and having inclusive designs, right? Um, as well as diverse designs. So we want people with different abilities, different environments to be able to you know, contribute to the web. And, and of course, get some, you know, inquire and get something back out of it. And of course, like in, in the, as in the beginning, we want to keep the web social, right? So, if you, if I were to just be extreme here, uh, the current scholarly publishing is, in a way, it's anti-social. It's a static, you know, documents that we kind of produce. You can't really, you, you know, you produce new other documents out there, but inherently, that the uh, that medium doesn't really give you that possibility to be social. And I'll give you some examples how you know the other on the other end of the things where it could be social. So, a uh, few things about you. I assume that some of you would know this already. Uh, so that we have four force, forces and functions, and we don't we don't have to take these things lit literally, but it's uh, it's useful enough to discuss. So we have uh, I'll, I'll focus on registration and awareness um, in this uh, talk, and of course actor and content. Uh, as well. Some of these functions or forces, they're external to the scholarly communication, so we're not particularly uh, concerned about it. Like archiving, for example, we assume that it's a trusted third party that's, uh, that's you know, committed or pledging to take care of. Um, of course, you may be an archivist, but, you know. Um, right. So, uh, just to have a a high overview on, on the difference between centralization and decentralization or centralized systems is something like this, right? We have uh, a, you know, a central server which everybody sort of hops on to create their profiles or create their data and, and to manage it, do read-write operations over there. Uh, so anything from uh, Facebook to uh, you know, GitHub, uh, virtually any third-party publisher, quote-unquote, uh, would fall into this category, okay? Uh, ORCID, sorry, it falls into that category. Hypotheses falls into that category because you're required to create profiles or, or you're required to you know, store your annotation at this server. That may, be, may not be a, a good thing uh, or preferred. That's entirely up to the uh, you know, decision makers. Um, it's just that we're, uh, we're, we're trying to see if we can you know, shift the paradigm towards something like this because it has certain qualities that are closely aligned with what the web offers, right? Potentials of the web. Um, so so this, uh, the examples and re remainder of the talk, we're going to focus on the decentralized approach. So this is the paradigm that I'm hoping that um, you can maybe consider in, in how we can integrate um, in, in the systems and the services or, or the tools and, that we develop. Uh, but before we go further, uh, you know, we, we, everybody passes around decentralization like it's nothing, and um, let's have a definition that we can work with. And it's 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 not the ultimate definition; it's just one definition that I find to be useful. 
I'm using it in my thesis, so I have to kind of commit to, commit to it. Uh, but it, I think the keyword here, you've already read this, I presume, but if, uh, for those who can't read in the back, a distributed system in which multiple authorities control different components and no single authority is fully trusted by all others. So no single authorities, there's an emphasis there. Um, and um, so we'll work with that. Uh, some myths, assumptions, realities. Uh, just because it's decentralized, it does not mean it's interoperable. Um, you may have a... We all have blog posts, you'll say. Uh, th that is a de decentralized uh, ecosystem in a way. But it doesn't mean that you know, what you publish on your website and what I publish on my website is you know, we, like, the content can't just easily move around. You use a different system, perhaps. Open doesn't mean it's free or inclusive. I mean, we'll um, focus on that as well. What are the constraints? When we, we say open all the time, but w you know, when you start asking a question of, well, can I publish anywhere, right? Uh, would, would the system, would the ecosystem allow me to self-publish? Like, where do we draw the line? And that's not always clear when we discuss, uh, you know, what it means to be open science, right? Um, just because there's a trend with a tool or a service or, uh, you know, uh, wildcard access uh, or something S, plan S. <laughs> It uh, doesn't mean that it is the right way. So we need to question these assumptions that we always have. Um, registration does not entail a third-party control, right? So just because uh, like publishing an article does not mean that uh, I have to give my document to a third party. Again, the web allows anyone to self-publish. So, um, And as you know, systems... Uh, Third parties in general would, for whatever whatever is worth, um, they do want to control your identity and data. Of course, we, we have agreements on what is good for the society or you know what is commons, and you know we, we may have an agreement on um, what are the trade-offs there. You know, if if I were to give it to a third party or if I want to use a third party service um, because maybe it's persistent, maybe they'll you know look after my data long term. These are trade-offs. So it's not that. Uh, you know, the centralized system is bad. Um, it's that what we want to aim is at whether we can have a system which allows, for example, me to self-publish and you to publish f through as third party um, work together. So we don't have to. We want. We don't want to force one one size sort of fits all solution here. Um, and I quoted. I, I tweeted something yesterday, and then Herbert von Sempel, um quote retweeted and. Uh, I'm going to read this because I think it's great. I was basically talking about oh, just because it's open source doesn't mean much. We, we want to aim for interop, right? So he said, couldn't care less whether infrastructure is operated using open source, commercial, uh, whatever software. It is about whether the infrastructure components provide open, interoperable, web-centric interfaces. I think that's really eloquent and uh, rings well for me. Uh, I hope for you as well. So we want to inter aim for interop, right? Because again, people may have different environments um, needs to use different tools. And we need to acknowledge that. Uh, we, we don't want everybody to hop onto the same application because, you know, again, for accessibility reasons, some, something as simple as that, they may need to use a different tool or a different identity provider. So let's work with some principles. Let's move, build on that. Uh, one of the principles is from, I'm just grabbing from LinkedIn notifications, W3C spec. I co-authored with my colleague, uh, Amy Guy, and the social web work group. And it says, data on the web should not be locked into particular systems or be only readable by the applications which created it. Users should be free to switch between applications and share data between them. So if you can sort of, while we're doing all this, you know, kind of an exercise almost, right? Like think of the tools and the services that you use and whether they allow you to do that. Um, whether, you know, you use some service and you put your data there, can you, easy, can you take that data out and put it somewhere else? Or can you just use it an arbitrary application or a user interface to interact with that data? Example, you, we can't just um, use any user interface or application to work with the Facebook data, right? We, we're kind of limited to a range of applications that would, or, you know, that's permitted or we have to register and so on. So what we're aiming for with Enthrop is that, well, uh, we don't care about the application. We care about whether, you know, that application speaks HTML or you know HTTP or URI or RDF and, and or SVG whether it speaks to those things. If it does, 
that's great. The data is you know, ready to go. We can switch between applications anytime we want. You know, if I want to use one application today, tomorrow I might want to use a different one. And it shouldn't be you know, uh, constrained to that application, the data that's created. Um, so just, I'll get into a little bit of, uh, about what uh, linked data notifications is see, um, and, and demo a few things. So it just a, it's just a protocol that lets you send and receive uh, notifications, right? And you can repurpose it for different things. Uh, and it does hit a bunch of these things where you have autonomy. We want persistent identifiers. Uh, so the notifi notifications that are created are reusable. Right? So they don't just disappear. You send a notification, we can still reuse it. Um, it looks something like this. It's, it's a very simple model. It's simple to implement even. Um, so we have a sender, you know, and if it wants to send something to tar target. Right? That target has an inbox, just like an email inbox. You send a notification, it stores it. The receiver stores it. And then the consumer can look, discover the notification just following the targets, inbox, and notification, right? And, and, and any application is not required to do all of this, right? So you can have one application that knows what, well, how that protocol works. And it can just be the sender. It can be just the consumer or all of them, doesn't matter. And there are rules, guidelines for this. Uh, ActivityPub, you should be aware of as well. It's, a, it's another protocol that uh, basically does social activities. Um, it specifies how a client can client application software can talk to a server, as well as how a server can talk to another server. Okay, and uh, it looks something like this: the interaction. So we have uh, Guinan here, uh, and uh, she posts an article into her outbox. She's on her server, and whoever is subscribed or following her, you know. Uh, Art, uh, articles or, or in, any posts, uh, they can get notified. And any time that some, someone else makes, creates an article and, and Alice or Guyan is interested in knowing, it gets sent to her inbox. Okay? It's just a very simple, and there's different activities for creating, you know, reading or deleting, liking, following, uh, questioning, rejecting, whatever, all that's different, different activities. And the inbox of activity pub protocol is based on linked data notifications. Um, social linked data uh, is a solid project. And the premise is, is really that we, we have choice on where we want to store our stuff, or which identities we want to use, or which identities do we want to link to each other, uh, which identities we want to be public or in private, and so on. Uh, we, we, we hope that we want to build applications that are uh, interoperable, speaking sort of a standard um, you know, content formats, uh, RDF in this case. Um, and we want to specify specific access uh, controls to each of the resources that we create or we want to share. So if I write an article and I only want to share it with some of you, then I just, you know, I know your web ID. I'll, I tell my system, my server that, OK, I want these web IDs to be um, able to read my, my resource. So Guinan, a simple graph. It's just imagine a graph. <laughs> I didn't have time to create a graph. Guinan has a personal storage, so it's just a one node pointing another node saying it's a personal storage and has an inbox. And Guinan knows uh, Ophelia, Eve, and Amy. Okay, so uh, uh, we're building on this now. So I've also created, um, extended the Orchid um, profile description. You can do this today. It's, it's it's been there for a while. You can, in fact, in your profile today, you can go there if you create a, if you have your own inbox and outbox or personal storage, you can add these fields. Just like you can add your website URL, you can say inbox, here's the URL for it, outbox, URL for it. And your, your ORCID actually is reusable as a, a FOF um, profile. Um, won't get into that detail right now. It's, it's just an RDF way of uh, describing yourself, right? So your ORCID profile is, in fact, machine readable. Um, the authentication, all that stuff is orthogonal to that. Um, so quick demos, uh, or I'll talk about Dokily, what this tool does. And it's really, it's a client-side application. Um, it's not a platform. It's not something that you install. It just runs in your web browser. It could be on a, in a part of a web page, or it could be part of, well, um, a browser extension, OK? And it does read-write operations. It doesn't do, it, it's, it's really, it's 
everything is based on the standards that are available to us. It has no design in there that is only unique to Dokley or would not be usable. So the data that it generates, if other applications speak, uh, you know, understand the same protocols or same um, set of content formats, vocabularies, whatever, uh, it will be able to reuse it. So it, it completely decouples. It's not a dependency. Uh, there's no dependency. You can remove it. I have five minutes. OK. OK, then I can maybe only one demo one thing here. So a bunch of standards here. Uh, we touched on some of them already. Um, and let's do one of them, or at least we'll go with it. So uh, we have a user here that simple use case user wants to share an application, uh, share this article with their friend. So Dokali is here. Uh, I signed in with my web ID. I'm going to share that with uh, some people in my, con in my contact social graph, right? So I memorize that Gaina guy knows Eve and Amy. Well, it's like this, right? So when I sign in, Dokali knows my social graph, my, my uh, graph, and I know these people, and they have inboxes, right? And I'm going to send them a message, just a link to the notification saying that, hey, uh, you know, check this article out. And when it does, it sends an inbox, a notification to their inbox, and it looks something like this. Nothing crazy, but all it says is who sent it when the license on the notification. Okay? Let's do one more. Uh, annotation. So this is using the web annotation uh, model, W3C web annotation. I'm going through the same process. The user signs in. Authenticates. They select a section and uh, some seg segment in an article. Uh, and it wants to annotate that, right? So when I signed in, Dokali knows my preferred storage location of my annotation okay? for, for where I want to store it. Like this article is at linkedresearch.org, LDN, just the old spec that we have here. And I'm annotating it. And Dokali picked up that I have a preferred storage location. The article happens to offer a, a public annotation service, so it can send a copy to it. And I can pick the license, Creative Commons license, that I want for that specific annotation. Okay? And when I click Submit, it sent in that split second, what happens is that it's, it's sent that annotation, put it on my uh, personal storage. It sent a notification to this article's inbox saying that there is an article, there's an annotation made. And then it can um, you know, position it to where, wherever that annotation was. OK, one more, just because it's really exciting. Uh, so we're going to cite something. And here's an article that's of interest. Uh, we're going to cite the introduction section, OK? I'm going to edit mode. I'm picking a section. Um, and we're going to cite. So we're going to, now we're going to make it, OK, before that, the common practice that we have for citations is a document cites document. So it's like a DOI cites DOI, right? What we're trying to do here is not the document, but the exact argument or the assertion or something some concept that's in the article. So we're trying to make a specific relation between what, what I've selected with that, um, I don't know if, we, if I went that too, fa too fast, but uh, you know, I said cites, I'm citing that for information purposes or evidence or I'm arguing or disputing it or whatever. It's like it's a type citation rather than exactly. a pure, pure thing. Exactly, yeah. So that sentence, whatever the reason is, we preserve the reason, the why, Right? It's structured. It's in RDF underneath, RDFA. And what Dokley does is it goes and fetches that article, the introduction, grabs, because that other article is structured, it knows the authors, the title, whatever, all that stuff. Um, not just the metadata, by the way, the whole article. So the other article is also structured, so you can discover the hypotheses and so on. And underneath that, there's a, connection, a relation now between that, what we just done. Right? Lastly, the artic this article over here happens to have an inbox. Okay? So Dokali discovered it, and it sent a notification to that article's inbox saying that, you can't read that. I can't even read it. 
but <laughs> it says that um, you know that uh, there was a citation made over here about this particular section, right? And there's a license for it. And so um, that's uh, there's more demos, but. Um, yeah, let's do that. OK. And I'll end it there because it's the bulk of what you need to know. And hope maybe you can uh, re consider some of these questions. I've got two, I've got two questions. Thanks. Um, first question is about the link notifications. Um, does that support uh, a kind of streaming architecture? So does it support things like fast and retries? Um, no. Um, uh, I can. It's well. This is based on the web stack uh, to start off with. So th those other things are not based on the web stack. Um, they're yeah. I mean, this is a rabbit hole. I can can talk for hours for that. But okay. it's it's a different stack. So this is based on HTTP and so on. The, the W3Cs, IETFs, uh, stack of standards, which is what the web runs on for almost 30 years. So. If we think the web is successful to some extent, maybe this approach is successful. But, or it's easier to, I think, in my opinion, I think it's easier to uh, jump or shift towards this approach. Not that those approaches, other approaches are not useful or to learn from. I think it's all great. Uh, but I, we've, we're, we're working on this. There's a framework of what we're working with. So, um, And how do the PID models uh, roll out? Because you mentioned that in terms of the the social elements, i.e. the message or the like, or there were PIDs in there. Are there PIDs in terms of like um, uh, things for annotations or, or other artifacts? Do you mean general? like PIDs? Uh, yeah. P pers uh, persistent identifier? Yeah. OK. Uh, how would they uh, play a role? Um, uh, well, I mean, it's uh, before that, I think, <laughs> sorry, uh, we, we need to keep this in mind, what the role of PIDs are, or registration, and what the role of, of archiving is. Okay, Just because if I were to use the data protocol, for example, uh, just because there are multiple copies out there, that's not a promise for archiving. Right? Uh, archiving has a completely, different, it's a completely different function. So when we're creating activities or social activities, we're actually talking about the registration only. So that may be a PID. That may not be a PID. because. I mean, depends on where you're storing it as well. So whoever controls the URI space controls, um, well, dictates like the, the rules under that web space. May I read you mind following up after we've just got two minutes to move to the next session? So sorry. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.